brief. I just want to welcome you all here to Hodgkin Huxley House for a meeting on electrophysiology. The Katz Auditorium at the Hodgkin Huxley House seems a great place to have it, I think. Um, I also want to welcome the people already online. I hear there are at least more than 50 of them out there in the big wide world watching us. So uh, it's, it's a small gathering here of uh, bespoke people of many ages. It's good to see young people, people from all over the place. Uh, but also there are people out there, and I'm sure the numbers will grow as the word spreads through the physiology community. Um, so I can take no credit whatsoever for really the idea, having the idea of setting up this symposium. I was sort of dragged in to just help get things going once uh, the idea was out there, which I think came more from um, John Isaac when he was still at Lilly and some of his uh, colleagues there. Um, but it's been fun putting it together, and I'm sure it's going to be a, a great day. Um, I am an electrophysiologist. In fact, I think uh, next year I'll celebrate my 30th year since I first put an electrode on a cell. I'm not quite pretty good and put an electrode on a cell again to celebrate or something like that. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm a translational electrophysiologist or not, but if the Wellcome Trust want to give me money, I'm quite happy to call myself a translational electrophysiologist, or the BBS, or the, any, any of you. Um, so um, I'm not going to uh, take up any more of your time. I'm going to move on to the first speaker, um, who is Keith Phillips, um, actually one of my collaborators, um, who comes from Eli Lilly's uh, Neuroscience Research Centre down in Surrey. So, okay, thank you, everyone. <coughs> As um, Andy said, I'm a a preclinical electrophysiologist mainly, uh, um, and um, I'm working at Lilly as a preclinical scientist. We talk about biomarkers a lot, uh, um, and I think um, the word biomarker uh, um, can mean very different things to different people, particularly within Lilly, and let alone uh, um, uh, within the outside world. And I think. Um, it's really important to understand what, what we mean or what we're trying to, under, what we're trying to gain from, from, a, from a biomarker, um, particularly when, when we're talking about um, how they go from a, a preclinical and, and into the cl a clinical world. So I've tried to sort of lay out um, how I sort of break them down, these types of biomarkers. And I think they're very important to, under, to understand, kind of they provide different levels of information um, at different stages within the, uh, it would, for us, within the different, uh, within the uh, a drug discovery process. Right through from, I think, from helping to us to validate a target um, in, in a preclinical experiment, all the way up to trying to prove that we've got our drug into the brain and have engaged our target in, a, in an early phase one a, a clinical study. And I think because of this, this variation in, 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 in the types of, of markers that we're, that we're using, it's very important to try and be clear about what we're trying to understand, what, what information we're trying to gain from it um, when, we, when, we're to, when we're talking about it. So the first type that I think what I'll talk about is um, a purely target engagement or, or pharmacodynamic response type biomarker. And this is really very simple for most people, I think. It's a very simplistic idea that basically we want to be able to measure a biological response in the brain, if we're talking about a central uh, uh, acting uh, a target, and relate it to the amount of drug in the plasma uh, uh, in, a, in a given experiment. And that seems, can be, seems very simplistic, but actually is really important for us um, to, to be able to make these predictions to help us understand, first of all, what level of drug we should be putting into our phase one, but also in terms of um, proving that we've actually um, just engaged the target and uh, we've actually can actually test a hypothesis in our phase one, phase one or, or phase two, two, two study. And I think, you know, um, obviously a lot, a lot of companies are now using a QEG and ERPs uh, around this, but I'll, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about more of this in, in a minute. I think the next level for me is then, but that's completely agnostic to actually um, the, the actual disease. It doesn't matter. What, what disease we're talking about. It's just how is the drug getting to the brain and, do, and doing something that we can measure to prove it's there, basically. The next level up that I, that, that I, that I think about is then circuit or pathway engagement, and that can be, again, preclinically or, or clinically. Can we prove that we're actually activating a circuit in the brain which is relevant to that, that disease? <clears throat> and then sort of linked to that, but slightly different, is then the back translation of this of, a dis of how we can measure a dysfunctional circuit in a disease back into our, our preclinical animal models. And they're sort of subtly different because they're used for sort of subtly different reasons in our, in our drug discovery process. And then finally, um, really, is can we use biomarkers as surrogates of, of efficacy? 
um, you know, can we use a biomarker uh, uh, to prove that our drug is actually going to do something good you know, in our clinical study? Now, I think this is always a struggle to understand because obviously if we're trying to improve memory in Alzheimer's disease, why don't we just measure memory in Alzheimer's disease? Or if we want to measure pain, why don't we just measure how much are you in pain? And I think the importance is, from a number of levels, is that first of all, in our early clinical studies, often the number of patients that we're using are actually quite small, and therefore potentially these measures of memory or pain are actually relatively bearable, and potentially using a more robust marker of efficacy um, might actually give us more, um, uh, um, more faith to move that, that project on into, into later, later development where we can power the study properly. But I think probably for me personally as a preclinical scientist is actually the opposite, is that if we can prove that a marker is relevant for efficacy in the clinic, then we can use that same marker preclinically to try and you know, um, help drive our projects from the early phases, uh, phases through. So for instance, pain is a great example of this. You know, it's very easy to measure pain in a patient. You can ask them, how much are you in pain? It's very hard to do the same in an in a animal. And therefore, if we can make those links um, the, from, the, from the clinic back to, the, to our, to our preclinical experiments, it makes um, our life designing new drugs um, and in that process much, much more easily, much more, much more easy. I think the final one, which I won't talk about, but it's obviously a very exciting area, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that today, is, is how we can actually stratify our patients by particular markers. So can we use EEG or can we use different sort of flavors and measures to actually pull apart um, different, different, different uh, groups within, within a given disease? So within schizophrenia, can we pull apart those that have particular phenotypes that we could then target with, with, with our disease? But I think, well, that's a kind of a, for, for the future. So very simple, so going to the first point in terms of a purely pharmacodynamic or PKPD type measures, one of the things that we've been using um, and trying to validate is actually just some very basic experiments using auditory ERPs. So this is just um, being able to, to uh, record uh, a trial average response in the EEG um, after a, a presentation of a tone. And uh, um, in, in our clinical studies, um, we've, we've been using this uh, uh, and, and trying to validate the use of this. And actually, in the clinical studies, we're actually using more of a, um, uh, an active oddball-based task, the classic P300 task, where you have to actually press a button when you hear the, the oddball. Now, that's a bit harder to do in, a, in, an, in an animal. So actually, what we've been concentrating on is just literally the standard tone, the, the ERP that is generated from the standard non-oddball uh, non tone. And you can see that the morphologies are actually relatively similar between a rodent and, and a human. The timings are a bit different to the amplitudes. But the morphology is, is, is actually quite, quite nicely preserved. And um, what we set out to do, which is pretty basic stuff, but very important for us, is actually to build a very strong case that we can actually back translate some experiments that we've done in the clinic. So this is actually looking at lorazepam as, a, as one of our active controls um, in, 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 our, in a clinical study, where we've measured, obviously, the amount of lorazepam in the, in the, in the blood, and then looked at the effects on our our auditory ERP in the standard tones and these P300 type waves, and basically said, you know, can we build a, a, a PKPD relationship, both over time and, and over dose of, of the drug? And then we've basically gone back and said, can we do the same in our animals, basically? And, and although we're still uh, slightly work in progress in this, this experiment, we see that basically we see very similar effects on the, on the sort of morphology of the ERPs, both in terms of um, the amplitude reductions, see it seem, seem, seem with this, um, this, this compound, there was a PAM. But the main real, main real aim of this is actually to be able to, to, to have used, so if, for instance, if we were trying to um, use lorazepam as our active drug, could, can we prove that um, at a given reduction in our ERP size, we, we, we know we have a particular amount of drug in the brain um, because, we, because we've done the preclinical experiment. And we can also go and show that in the preclinical experiments we can knock, knock the receptor out and show that that response is on target. So it, it's a very simplistic but really important for us to have this, this type of measure in place so we can really be sure that we've got both the right concentration of drug in the brain for our, for our phase one and phase two studies and that also that we've, that we've, um, that we've tested a hypothesis, uh, we've engaged our target in a high enough amount to actually test that we can see, see some kind of efficacy signal when we move to the larger studies. I'm going to try and highlight this, uh, this, this idea of these different flavors of biomarkers with, with a, a project that we, that we, that we were running. Um, uh, it was an ex early exploratory project um, for, for a schizophrenia target, actually. Um, it had a number of issues with this, this, this project, but um, we'll use it as, kind of a, as, 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 a, as an example. And the idea was based around the idea that, um, we'll hear more about this today, I'm sure, um, that in schizophrenia there's a, a, there's a dysfunction of the kind of inhibitory excitatory balance. 
which kind of leads to uh, dysfunction of neur neural oscillations and um, is partly due to, to dysfunction of, particular, of a particular cell type, the fast spiking, uh, the pub positive fast spiking interneuron. And it was a relatively simplistic idea that, if, like in this Jess Carlin paper, where they could activate the fast spiking interneurons, you could actually uh, uh, rescue or enhance gamma oscillations. We thought, well, let's try and do that pharmacologically um, and prove it so if we can see the same effect. So um, we just identified a, a, a target that was, that, was, that was preferentially expressed on these interneurons, and this, this potassium tunnel, which is important for elite conductance, was, was thought to be at least um, more expressed on these part of cells than, 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 than other cells. Uh, both from literature data and, and some internal data where we showed that we could actually depolarize these fast spiking interneurons, but we didn't have any effects on other interneuron types and also no effects on, on um, uh, uh, pyramidal cells in the, in the hippocampus. We wanted then to go and ask, what, is, can, what can we measure um, in terms of uh, in vivo electrophysiology that, that might highlight the, the, this activation of, of this uh, a, a pyramidal cell inter interneuron circuit. So very basically, first of all, we just did a QEG study. So this is what I would call the kind of the first level or pharmacodynamic response type, type experiment. And we showed that we could, we do see a, a nice increase in blue. This is the task, this is an inhibitor of this, this receptor activates those cells. So by putting on the, the inhibitor, you actually activate fast spiking interneurons. You can see as we, we, we were hoping and, and, and were pleased to see an increase in, the, in, in gamma oscillations just on the, on the basic QEG, which was lost if we knocked, the, knocked that receptor out. So that kind of was the first tick in a way that we, you know, we, ha we have this uh, a, a pharmacodynamic response which was probably on target. But what about, that doesn't really tell us much, I mean, you could argue potentially that gamma power changes might be related to, to, to directly to interneuron circuit function, but I think we wanted to go a bit beyond that and try and see, can we show that we've actually activated the circuits that, that we care about? So what we did was we implanted electrodes in multiple parts of the brain, in the, in the cortex and, uh, and, and, and deep, deep electrodes in hippocampus and prefrontal, uh, in hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, and then not, not only looked at the power changes, but also looked at connectivity in terms of the synchrony of the local field potential oscillations, and what we see saw was that not only did we see this increase in the gamma response um, that we'd seen in, in the QEG, but we also saw increases in gamma connectivity within the hippocampus, for instance, here, and also, um, but also um, uh, increases in connectivity in, in lower frequency range and this beta frequency range between hippocampus and, and, and cortex. So that kind of, that was another, it was just building the, the evidence that, that we were at least thinking that we were, we were engaging the circuits that we think are important uh, um, for um, uh, for the, for the uh, impairments and cognition seen in, in schizophrenia. But there is, although there is evidence of dysfunctional synchrony in cortical circuits, there's not much evidence actually of, of hippocampal cortical dysfunction in schizophrenia. So we wanted to come up with a marker that was actually translatable into the clinic and, and, and then uh, that we could do preclinically. And one of the things that I was very interested in, in using was actually sort of passive stimulation because that's why it's much easier to do in a high throughput setting. Uh, um, in, for, for, doing, for, for doing our kind of uh, pharmacological experiments. And um, you, can, you, can, you can probe this circuit. It's been suggested you could probe the circuit by using um, very basic sensory stimulation. And we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more about this today from Peter and from Chris Singh's uh, presentations, where you can either use auditory or visual stimuli to actually try and look at the oscillatory entrainment of cortical circuits. And in this case, what they're, what they're doing is basically in this, in this paper on the left, they're basically looking at a different frequency of, to of auditory tones um, between 20 and 80 hertz, and look at the, looking at how the induced power or, or, and, and the synchronization of, that, of, that, of these oscillations um, are during the presentation of these high frequency auditory bursts and it's known that at least the, the phase locking of, the, of, these, uh, of, of these oscillations in schizophrenia is definitely reduced and also the, the uh, induced power that, that, is, that is caused or, or the, the ability for the cortical network to, to entrain to these high frequencies is also reduced in, 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 in schizophrenia. We were particularly interested in this because a, collab a collaborator at the time at, 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 at Lund that Lumbeck had shown that in a schizophrenia mouse model um, that actually they could completely uh, uh, they completely lost this uh, auditory entrainment of, of, of these cortical os oscillations, and importantly they also they also went on to show that actually this was potentially due to an inter interneuron dysfunctional uh, uh, a deficit 
in the cortex. And therefore, we were interested to see if we, our, our, our compound, which, which we, we thought was activating inter interneural function, could also modulate this uh, um, in, in our preclinical experiments. And, and that's what we found. So we found that actually you can do these type of experiments very easily preclinically, um, just by playing these, these high-frequency bursts of, 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 of tones. And you can see that although it's slightly different to the, to the, clinic, to the, to the human setting, whereby actually the, 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 the rat cortex seems to be tuned to a slightly higher frequency, more like a 80 hertz than, um, than, than these lower 40 hertz as seen in, in, the, um, in the human studies, you can see that these, you get these hot spots of, of, uh, um, of, uh, of activity when you play these, these high frequency tones. And our, our, our task inhibitor managed to actually enhance a trend to enhancement at the 40 hertz and also a high significant increase at, at this 80 hertz uh, activity. However, I think this comes back to the, 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 sort of the final aspect of this. It comes back to the, 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 this, this, it shows that we managed to engage um, you know, it's the circuits which we think are important. It's, it's engaged a, a, a oscillation which we think is translatable, but it doesn't really tell us much about in terms of is it going to work in terms of in schizophrenia. And I think we stopped that project for a variety of reasons, but um, one of the reasons was that we didn't, we didn't see any actually measures of increases in, in um, efficacy in terms of uh, uh, memory. So I wanted to just quickly fin finally talk about how, what, what we do um, uh, uh, to try and identify this. And I think one of the things that I want to point out is that a lot of this has been work that's been done because of what's been done in the clinic and then what we've, what we've been trying to, to back translate into our preclinical experiments. Well, I think for a lot of these type of efficacy measures that we, that we use is actually the op opposite. A lot of this is based on preclinical experiments and potentially these preclinical experiments need to lead to clinical experiments to try and, to try and match up with what we're doing because of, what, because of, the, because of the, 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 the amount of work that's, been gone, that's, that's gone into this. So the, the, the assay that we use a lot at, at, at Lilly for, 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 for looking at this, this sort of measure of efficacy, a biomarker of efficacy preclinically, is um, a spatial working memory task. So we, we're interested in, in particularly in memory in Alzheimer's disease and, 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 and have been in schizophrenia. And this, this assay allows you to, 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 to do, uh, to, we have to test both spatial and, and, and working memory components. And what we do is we ask the animal to run around this, this teammate's task and basically say, if, you, if, you, uh, if he's running up the center arm, he's then forced to turn uh, uh, right or left. And then he runs back down to the beginning of this, of this automated teammate's and then is held there for a certain amount of time, can be up to, up to a minute, and then is then let free and has to go run up to that choice point to make a decision. And the, the, the classic rule that we use is just that if he was forced to turn right in, in, the, in the sample phase, phase of, the, of, the, of the task, he then has to uh, choose left to get his reward. And what we do is we basically are in, uh, have implanted the, these animals with electrodes in multiple structures, hippocampus, prefrontal, and, and multiple, multiple cortical sites, and then look at things like power change, power changes, and also changes in, 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 in synchrony. And what we, we're running these uh, generally uh, using wireless transmitters to allow us to have kind of a, the level of uh, uh, throughput that, that we can use to actually to, to, to be able to characterize our, our projects. Um, this is just an example, some example data from one of our animals just explaining how, how we run the analysis. So this is looking at the, um, the LFP activity in the, in the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, and you can see these, these are now power spectrum plots looking at the power as the animal runs up to this choice point. This choice point is marked by this white line, and you can see um, quite clear changes in power in CCA1 and, and prefrontal cortex. But also, you, we also are measuring the, the level of synchrony between the, these two structures uh, 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 using coherence. You can see uh, that's been previously published by numbers of groups uh, that, that as you run up to this choice point you see this hot spot in, 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 in connectivity between, between these structures as the animal reaches that, 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 that decision point. This, in, is, this increase in synchrony in, is, is increased with, with learning and that, in fact actually disappears with overtraining and we can impair this with things like ketamine or CB1 agonists uh, um, and the, 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 the reduction in, in connectivity you see here um, quite co often correlates very nicely with the, with the, the performance the animals are, 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 are running on the task. And we were very interested in using this, these types of measures um, to try and characterize our Alzheimer's uh, um, uh, models, for, mainly for two reasons, really. One was to um, try and identify, identify functional markers of decline in our Alzheimer's models. <laughs> Um, to allow us to basically then go in and test our, our, our tau therapies or, or, or A-beta therapies to show that not only can we change biochemical methods uh, 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 measures in these models, but we actually have an impact on, on, the, on the networks that are, that are going wrong. Um, but also to try and understand what, which of these types of measures might be able to be used at, actually 
in the clinic uh, in, in the future to, to be able to actually sh show um, uh, um, a changes in disease progression. And the, the model that we've used the most is this, this tau model. Um, it's, a, it's, the, it's, the, it's the RTG 4510 model. It's an inducible tau model where you can actually stop uh, production of this of this, 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 this tau species using doxycycline. Um, we've characterized this a lot in our, in our behavioral assay, in the, in the teammates task. And you can see very clearly that although this is now looking at different age group, groups of animals, the pathology starts to kick in at about four months and goes on to, to about uh, eight months. And you get very strong pathology by, by about 12 months. We actually saw that was actually a, a, a quite a strong impairment, even at the very pre-pathology ages. So this is at sort of the two months age point. You can see that animals are actually impaired on this teammates based task. But there's also this this um, aspect of, of a progressive decline in performance as well, but between about four and 12 months. And we wanted to know, can we identify measures, uh, electrophysi electrophysiological measures that would reflect that, that progressive, that's the bit we're interested in, this progressive decline in performance. So what we did was we did our classic recordings of hippocampal prefrontal recordings. And what we found when we were looking at actually these old animals, Actually, the hippocampus was actually massively affected. So this is a power spectrum plot uh, at the top from the hippocampus. And you can see that there's just a very clear broadband reduction in, in power. However, in the cortex, actually, there's a much more subtle effect. And this, this actually matches the pathology. The hippocampus goes, is, is probably lost very much earlier in, 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 this, in this model. In this experiment, we probably recorded it. We're, we're, actually, too, we're actually too late in, in recording. Um, but, and also the connectivity between these structures was also completely abolished. However, what we were really interested in was actually what changes with, with, with time in this model. So you can see that the hippocampal measures, this is just, I just picked a couple, theta and gamma, don't really change much. Although if they do, they're, they're so affected at this early time point that we can't see a progressive change over uh, uh, between six and eight months that we recorded. However, in the prefrontal cortex, at least, this gamma change that we saw, although it was only subtle at the six-month change time point, became very, strong, very, very highly significant at, at this eight-month eight, eight month time point. So this is quite a nice measure that we've now identified that we can now use to try and uh, uh, see if, if, if we then use a, have a, a, a towel therapy, we can actually rescue this, this functional effect. The same, the same was true for the connectivity, although, again, it was quite strongly impaired at this six-month time point. There was also a, 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 an increase in, 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 this, in this deficit as, 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 as the model progressed, actually progressed. And what we're trying to do now, really, is trying to understand you know, that this correlations between um, the performance on the team A's tasks. So this is now looking at back at this, this performance over time, um, it's percent correct, and then over, overlaying this with, with our gamma change and then our coherence change here. How do these, these measures sort of correlate to the pathology, to the, to the performance uh, on our tasks uh, um, and our, our, our measures? To try to identify really sensitive measures that we can use to then um, test our therapies, our, our therapies on. And ultimately, we'd like to try and move you know, which of these measures can, uh, can be used uh, then it, it, in the clinic. OK, so I think I'll probably run out of time. So I'm going I'm to finish, finish there. And um, I think. In, in summary, I think the, 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 the key message was, was that I think the, the, the types of biomarkers we use, both preclinically and clinically, are, are very important to identify what, what the question is that we're, that we're asking. And I think moving forwards, we're very interested to understand you know, how can the, these, measures that we've, these measures of efficacy that we're, that we're using preclinically be used in the clinic. And that's. So the prefrontal gamma was was quite. I think it was more specific to the actual. To, the, to, the, to a band. So, the, if you, I mean, the trouble with if you group average animals, you often lo lose the peaks and things. But, but the, I think it clearly was a reduction in, in a more of a specific band than compared to the hippocampus, where you saw much more broad band just reductions. I think if you do normalizations for, for total power and things, you do see in, in the hippocampus, you do see selective reductions in, in other frequencies. But the kind of the, at this age point that we were looking at, at least, we were probably too late to see specific changes. Nice, nice quality. The first part of your talk, 
talk about the effects on hospitals and Syria. How can you exclude that, for instance, the drug doesn't work uh, uh, upstream of your pathway somewhere in the auditor system where you have passed the volume as well? As opposed to specifically? <coughs> um, it's a good question. I think. Um, if we, I think the, the plan would have been to go on to have done single unit recording, and that would have been how we would have we would like to have done in the models the single unit recording um, to look at interneuron firing during these these types of uh, um, uh, uh, protocols, and that's been shown to actually have you can modulate the firing frequency of interneurons in, in that, and I guess then you would have have a, a more direct measure, I guess. So, yeah, I, I'm just wondering. I mean, you spent a vast amount of time setting up all these assays and all this technology and things. What do you think is limiting your progress more? Is it, is it the technology or do you think it's the models you're working with? In terms of understanding really where you want to go? I think it's um, I think it's the partly the models, I I agree. So it depends on what we're trying to do in a way. So for, the, for, for our Alzheimer's models, for instance, as, as an example, I think they're potentially extremely good for understanding how, uh, say, an antibody can reduce tau or, or, or amyloid. But if that really relates to um, changes in cognition in a, in a human, I think it's a bit different. So you kind of, I think the issue there is the, is the models. But then all, equally, I think knowing which um, which, which, which measures to use preclinically that have been well validated clinically is also extremely important. So we use all these slightly fancy, you know, these different types of te uh, analysis techniques preclinically, but none of them have been very well validated clinically that we can then trust enough to be able to use as a decision maker in our early studies. And I think that's the biggest issue probably. So actually things like P300 might be better because they've been used a lot more and therefore we have a lot more faith in them probably because there's a lot more data out there. I guess and that's almost probably what we should be doing more of is, is potentially is, is, is the, the simpler things to start with actually.